Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, tonight. We have Sarah Lohman back to talk about cocktails tonight. It's a great summer presentation for sure. Um, so just stay tuned while we let people in at just another few minutes, and then we'll get started. Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, thank you. I'll be right back. I'll be right there. I will be just stepping away for just a just a minute. I'm at a public desk tonight, so um, I'll be right back. Hi everyone, I'm back. Um, thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who have just tuned back, tuned in, um, I'm Jessica. I'm from the Chelmsford Library. I'm here with Sarah Lohman, who's going to present the eight flavors of the, the untold story of American mixology, which is a super fun program for the summer for sure. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a couple minutes here before um, seven o'clock to let you know about a few upcoming programs. Uh, we do have the pop up is on the move. Um, our pop-up library will be at the Market on the Common on Saturday, July 23rd from 1 to 3 p.m. Come and see us. Um, check out a book, get a library card, um, whatever you want to do, or just say hi. Um, and then um, we'll be uh, going all the way through August. Uh, we don't have the September schedule, but we definitely have a lot of really great stops um, through the end of July and August. Um, on, on Monday, July 25th, we have a... a public information presentation. Um, it's sort of a civic engagement presentation. It's called The Trouble with Tanglers, Recycling in Plastic Bags and Film. And it's all about how you can participate in the Bags to Benches program by recycling your film plastic. A fun program for this time of year. On Tuesday, July 26th, we have, um, we have uh, Kate Donovan of um, Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens uh, will be on to talk to us about how to attract native pollinators to your garden. Um, our summer concert series continues on Wednesday night live at the McKay Branch Library starting at 6.30 p.m. We have Mika's Groove Train, uh, which is a really awesome band that does um, sort of soul, classic soul and R&B, um, and it's really great. And then, of course, on August 18th, we have Sarah Lohman back um, for Ranji Smile, America's first celebrity chef and the history of Indian cuisine in America. And that will be at 7 p.m. on Thursday, August 18th. Um, super excited to continue this series. Um, but first tonight, she's going to present the eight flavors of cocktail history with Sarah Lohman. Um, and actually she has uh, the, the untold story of American mixology. So this is gonna be really good. Um, Sarah Lohman is the author of Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine, uh, released in 2016 with Simon & Schuster. Eight Flavors is a number one bestseller on Amazon. The Atlantic called the book richly researched, intriguing and cleverly written. Formerly the curator of food programming at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, she has lectured at hundreds of universities and institutions nationwide, including the Museum of Science Boston, love that museum, the American Museum of Natural History and the New York Public Library. Tonight she presents the Eight Flavors of Cocktail History, uses She's a, she'll use eight different ingredients as a path to explore the history of mixology from the 18th century to the present day. 
Uh, she'll explore the histories of juniper, citrus, nutmeg, ice, anise, grenadine, cola, and flavored vodka with brief digressions into tea, bitters, eggs, hay, and the no flavor push of the vodka era and Red Bull. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really excited uh, for this program and um, sit back, cool off and enjoy. Hi, everybody. It's always such a delight to be with you all. You're all just such lovely participants. Um, so some of you have probably been to one of my talks with this library before. Um, so this talk tonight is based on my book, Eight Flavors. Uh, and in that book, available at the library or anywhere books are sold, um, what I do is I picked eight common flavors in American cooking, and I use them to tell a story both about our, let's say, give a timeline as to how America, the flavors of American food have shifted, but also to tell a history of American culture through these food and flavors. So this talk about drinks history um, came out of Tales of, of the Tales of the Cocktail, which is a cocktail convention in New Orleans. And the director at, at the time, a couple of years ago, I think this is probably 2017 or 2018, reached out and asked if I could do a drinks history based on my book, which I really, really loved as a challenge. So that's what we're gonna to explore tonight. We're gonna to look at the history of American mixology, which is an important world history because the cocktail arguably was invented in America, but certainly by the early 19th century, it was the part of any tourist visit to America was to try one of these American cocktails. But our story is even going to start a little bit before that, even before uh, the United States of America existed, to really talk about where uh, the history of spirits and alcohol come from. So as always, I love taking questions. Um, we don't have a Q&A option tonight, so please just pop any questions you have in the chat. I've got my chat open. I'm going to try to keep an eye on it, um, and hopefully Jess is going to help me out with that as well. So we've got a lot to cover tonight, so let's dive in. There's my book, by the way, if you're curious to read it after this talk and get a food history perspective instead of a drinks history perspective. Okay, so to begin at the beginning, we're going to talk about juniper. Juniper, famously, is the main flavor of gin. In fact, for something to be called gin, it is required by law to contain juniper. Now, in the modern day, there are a lot of gins that express different flavors. American gin as a whole, for example, tends to be very citrusy relies more heavenly, uh, heavily on things like lemon, grapefruit, and orange. There are even gins coming out of England now uh, that, uh, like Hendrix is a great example, uh, cucumber and rose gin that have sort of interesting, more complicated flavors. But juniper is one of the original flavors for this distillate of alcohol. If you've got a question, you don't even have to raise your hand. Just please put it in the chat. I've got my chat open and I'll be able to answer it so that we don't have to like unmute and things like that too. So juniper, interestingly, isn't a berry. It's actually a fleshy pine cone. Juniper is a very old plant in that it existed before the continent split. So it was there in Pangaea. So there are varieties of juniper on several different continents. The one that's most commonly used to flavor gin is from Eastern Europe. But honestly, juniper is used a lot in landscaping. And uh, you know, get your ID apps out there. You could be making your own gin from your own locally harvested juniper berries. Now, to, to talk about the, the longer history of distilling. So distilling was invented in Persia um, sometime before the 13th century. It's a little unclear when. And there it wasn't used to make spirits. It was used to make um, like scented waters and oils, like orange flower water and rose water. And then the other components of that is rose oil and orange flower oil. It wasn't until distilling moved into Europe sometime in the 13th century that it began to be used to distill alcohol. Now what happens is in a still, uh, in the, this is what a still would have looked like in the Middle Ages, but in some ways they're kind of similar today. The principle is the same. You put a lower proof fermented beverage in the big barrel of the still. So like today, essentially beer is fermented into wine. Historically, one of the first things fermented, excuse me, Beer is fermented into whiskey. In this case, uh, wine would be fermented into brandy. Um, and what they were making early on from like either a corn mash ferment or a grape mash ferment, they called aqua vitae. Um, aqua vitae means um, water of life. And this was so rare and so valuable in the Middle Ages that it was treated as a medicine. 
The process of creating alcohol, uh, distilled alcohol, was uh, created by alchemists. Today, we just call them chemists. I feel like alchemists are more famous for the journey of trying to turn lead into gold. Um, but at the same time, alchemists were the sort of chemists and scientists um, of our Middle Ages history, our first half of our post the year 1000 history. Um, so there is some benefit to that in that uh, alchemists would make herbal tinctures to treat different diseases. And soaking something in alcohol pulls out a lot of more of the esters, the compounds, the chemicals, the essential oils um, that, oh, great. Renee, thank you. Renee, yes, 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 yes. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna, try. sorry, I'm laughing because Renee raised her hand because the chat wasn't working. And I was like, Renee, put it in the chat. Sorry, Renee, thank you for being a help. I really appreciate it. So um, I thought you all were being a little, little quieter than normal. Okay, so when you put herbs into a, a distilled spirit, aqua vitae, it pulls out the different compounds and essential oils better. So it's a more effective way of making one of these herbal tinctures. And one of the earliest uh, infusible items that was used to make medicine was juniper. All of the Romans, juniper was being used as medicine. So in the Middle Ages, it was, it was infused into aqua vitae and used as a healing tonic. And that, so the original gins that were drank for fun were called Genever, and they were being developed in Holland uh, by the 15th century. Uh, one of the oldest brands of Genever, uh, one of those original brands of Genever still exists, it's Bowles Genever. For a long time, it wasn't importable into the United States, um, but now with the sort of cocktail revival and looking at older methods, old recipes often call for Bowles Genever by name. You can now once again get it in the United States. Comes in two forms, old and young. Um, old is an aged Jennifer and will have a darker color, and young is a little bit more what we're used to in terms of a gin, um, that it is unaged and uh, white in color, clear in color. So Jennifer, or gin, spreads to Britain during the 16th, 15th and 16th century. Uh, Britain is occupying Holland. There's a lot of wars back and forth, and the British soldiers noticed that uh, the Dutch soldiers would take a shot of, a, of this liquid, of their Jennifer, um, and then they would fight more bravely. So uh, they began to call this Dutch courage. The British soldiers occupying Holland got a taste for Jennifer and the idea of the alcohol was bought, brought back to Britain. In Britain, it was a little bit different. Uh, traditional Holland Jennifer is basically just uh, alcohol infused with juniper. It is very, very strong and has a very strong, of course, pine flavor, but juniper berries also have chemicals that are in common with um, marijuana and also rosemary too, and a little bit of hints of lemon as well. Um, but in England, they began to add more citrus. They added coriander, which is also like a nice pairing to it adds a little bit of a, a spicy citrus flavor to it. Coriander is in America, we, we call that the seeds of cilantro. In England, that's the name for both the cilantro and its seeds. So that's sort of like citrusy cilantro flavor. And they also began to add a little bit of sugar to sweeten the gin. Now, because of that, um, gin began to be villainized by the 17th century in England. It was believed that because it was a little bit sweet, because it was this flavored alcohol, that it would be more appealing to women who would then, as you can see in the picture, feed it to their babies and their toddlers. So there's actually something else going on there, not just a, a fear of spirits. Part of it is that this is the first distilled spirit that's widely available. When aqua vitae was first being made, it was available only for the very wealthy and it was used as a medicine. Um, until Jennifer and gin became widely available. I mean, by the 18th century in Britain, there was like a, a gin distillery for every 25 people or something like that. Um, the made drinks were things like wine or in England, it would be ale. So much, much, much lower proof alcohol. Ale, we're talking like at maximum eight to 12% alcohol. And with gin, of course, we're talking 40 to 60% alcohol. So people are having trouble with it because it is a new type of drink that gets you drunk a lot more quickly um, than anything that was available before. Additionally, the other issue is that many of these gin shops are owned and run by women. 
The other public spaces, taverns, uh, things like that, eventually coffee shops and tea houses, these are often very male spaces. But since gin is new, it doesn't have the same like traditional social mores that going out and having a beer at a tavern did. So gin shops were one of the few public places available to both men and women. And especially for women, it was one of the only spaces they had that wasn't their home or their workplace. So a lot of this the sort of anti-gin sentiment also had to do with an anti-woman sentiment too, that uh, the sort of upper crust didn't like see, seeing women behaving outside of their social order. And in general, didn't like to see people who were working class or poorer spend money on alcohol. Another sort of critique that we hear frequently, I think even today, what someone who's impoverished should or should not spend their money on. But that just kind of comes back to not allowing someone whose life might be very difficult, a little bit of freedom and the choice of where to spend their money. So the whole like gin craze as it was known, but also gin shaming, it was definitely a thing. So this is the earliest spirit that was drunk widely by a broad range of people in Europe. Oh, and I should say that the rich didn't like that something that used to be only available to them was now available to all classes in these very affordable gin shops. The next big flavor of alcohol comes with citrus. So all citrus um, is descended from just four ancestral citrus, which is native to Asia and China. Um, the four ancestral citrus are the, um, this is the pepita, this is the one I always forget. This is the citron, which you've, you've probably seen around. Um, it's becoming more common and popular, and it is, at, at the very least, a pretty common ingredient in like um, fruitcake fruit mix. This is the pomelo or pomelo which I'm in New York City currently, and you'll see this a lot, especially in like Middle Eastern and Muslim neighborhoods. And the last one is the mandarin orange. So all other citrus varieties are made from crosses between these four breeds and then crosses from the resulting breeds and on and on and on. And actually it was a hobby um, up through the 19th century to collect, like botany was a, an emerging science and a big hobby. And so you'd collect different citrus varieties, especially particularly odd ones. And the Buddha's hand citron is one of the sort of strange varieties that have survived since then. If you've ever seen it, it kind of looks like an op octopus or a ghost or a hand. It's yellow and has these like big thin thick like finger-like things on it. It's really, really interesting. So citrus is important because it's one of the five ingredients in a traditional punch recipe. Um, punch becomes popular in the 17th and 18th centuries. One theory that's out there is that it comes from um, the word panch, which is an Indian dialectical word for five. So panch, five, punch. And this was a drink that became popular in colonial occupied India. So uh, that area of the world also had developed its own uh, spirits in the terms of like a palm wine or a, um, like a, and then the spirits distilled from that. And traditionally you take a spirit, something like wine or gin, or as we move further along, rum or whiskey, um, and then you're gonna mix that with the juice of citrus. Um, then you're also gonna take some sugar and rub it on the rind of the citrus to get that like lemon or orange or whatever it is flavor and the citrus goes in there too. Um, you're gonna add a little bit of water and then you're gonna add a little bit of other flavoring. Usually that is a little couple gratings of nutmeg, which we'll talk about in just a minute as well. So punch is a very communal drink. Um, there's you know a little bit of communality to like doing shots of gin in one of those gin shops, but um, punch is like you come together and have punch. That might be in like a public space, like a tavern, that might be in one's home. Uh, for men, they were drinking punch mainly, but if it was like a punch party in the home, then women would be drinking as well, seen largely as an aristocratic drink. And you'd have a friend who is like your friend group's punch maker that would have like all the various tools of punch making, the punch bowl, the ladle, the nutmeg, the grater. There were even these solid silver nutmeg carriers because up until the 1840s, nutmeg was incredibly expensive, yet an extremely important addition to punch. So when you think about cocktails today, um, one of the important factors of mixing a good cocktail is to hit on as many basic tastes as possible. 
So that's why we add a dash of bitters, which we're gonna to get to. That's why we add some citrus juice too. So we've got bitter, we've got sour, a little sugar, we've got sweet. The more sort of taste you can fill out, the more well-rounded a drink that you can make. These are a couple of basic punch recipes. These are uh, recipes from the first published cocktail guide out there. This is how to mix drinks from 1862. So by the time this book is published, a lot of the, like the idea of drinking punch is kind of out of fashion. That's in 1860s, like that's what your grandparents did was drink punch. You drank cocktails. We'll talk more about that. But um, we do have individual recipes. There's a recipe for milk punch from Ben Franklin. It doesn't actually include milk. It uses milk as a clarifying agent, but that's a whole nother thing to get into. Charles Dickens, although he was writing in the middle of the 19th century, he loved history. And so he was like a big punch historian. So he, we have some punch recipes from him. Um, and we have these documented ones from Jerry Thomas, a very famous mid-century bartender um, that wrote down these recipes. So you can see like number 11, the gin punch is a pint of old gin. I talked about old versus young, so it's an aged gin. Um, a gill, I think a gill is half a wine glass, I think it's like two ounces of maraschino. The juice of two lemons, the rind of half a lemon, four ounces of syrup, that's simple syrup, one quart bottle of German seltzer water, that would be a um, bubbly spring water and ice as well. So that's like your basic punch recipe, but even without the ice, that's more of a 19th century thing. We'll get to that too. So the transition, like cocktails are basically tiny individual punches. And so in one way, it makes sense that they're invented in America. We focus a lot on individualism, right? My rights, my needs. And so maybe in a strange way, that's where cocktails come from. So it's all about taking these big drinks and making them singular. But since now we're talking about singular drinks, there's a lot more variety. I will say that in the early cocktails, which are popping up at the end of the 18th century, they're more like formulas. Like you can see on this page from How to Mix Drinks, these are all slings. So it even says the brandy sling is made with the same ingredients as the brandy toddy, except you grate a little nutmeg on top. The whiskey sling is fill a tumbler one third full of boiling water and grate nutmeg on top, and then you put whiskey in there too. The gin sling is made with the same ingredients as the gin toddy, except you grate a little nutmeg on top. So what sets slings apart is that grate a little nutmeg on top, that that was the prominent flavor of them. There was also a category of drinks called the cocktail. Cocktail used to be one drink, not a category of drinks. And cocktails were a spirit plus water plus sugar plus bitters. There was also juleps. The mint julep is actually quite an old drink. We have references to that dating back to the 1780s. Whereas the cocktail, we kind of date to like maybe 18 excuse me, 1804 or something like that. There were also slings, toddies, as you can see, and cobblers as well. And these were formulas where, and what makes a martini, those arguments are usually on the spirit, like a Manhattan cannot be a Manhattan without rye whiskey. Um, but when we're talking about these traditional cocktails, it's the nutmeg that made this a sling, not the spirit. So whether you made it with brandy, whiskey, or gin, it was all a sling as long as there was nutmeg on top. So a little bit different way about thinking about mixing drink. And so that brings us to bitters. So I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that alcohol was used to make these medicinal tinctures from a wide variety of different herbs and uh, spices. And um, so these medicines, which were known as patent medicines in the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries, even though they were totally unpatented, um, were widely used throughout uh, England and throughout uh, America as well. In fact, during the Revolutionary War, American soldiers received like a shot of bitters every morning uh, and it was called taking your medicine. And that practice then kind of spread to the everyday after the war that first thing in the morning, you would do a shot of bitters, which by the way is about 35% alcohol um, because that was gonna make you healthy for the rest of your day. And then people began to discover that if they took this uh, uh, 60 proof alcohol um, and instead of just drinking it straight, mix it with water or with tea or with other alcohol, like whiskey, for example, in the cocktail, that made it taste even better. So bitters went from like a medicinal swig in the morning to like your morning cocktail. And so nutmeg becomes a popular cocktail ingredient in the first half of the 19th century. 
as do bitters. And they are um, a important part of the original drink called a cocktail. Now, by the middle, by the first half of the 19th century, um, people are drinking in bars for the first time. I sort of mentioned punch houses or the home. I mentioned taverns. I mentioned gin shops. The hotel bar is very much an American institution. So I apologize for the size and quality of this image. This is of the recreated bar space at the Mount Vernon Hotel and Museum, which is on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. They're the only, <coughs> excuse me, recreated bar space that I've ever seen. And I, you know what, I really need to go up there and take my own picture because I think I pulled this from their website. So hotels, we know what a hotel is. They're basically the same thing the 19th century, except for the most part, genders were separated. Of course, if you're traveling with your husband, you'd be in a room together. But uh, in a place like the Mount Vernon Hotel and Museum, there was a ladies room upstairs. And then the bar on the lower level uh, was for the men. Um, the bar room is where you did your drinking. You can see the tables where you'd sit. Um, as well as spittoons on the floor. But the actual bar was barred. It had stored not only the alcohol, but the cash box for the hotel. So it might be a little difficult to see, but the door would close and lock, but there was also these, this barred grate that would swing down and lock in the front as well. So it was the whole thing was lockable and covered with bars, which is how these spaces got the name bars. And bars are what began serving cocktails, Dickens famously mentions on his journey through America in 1842, going to the hotel in Boston so that he can partake of the splendors of American cocktails. And he sort of describes the bar room, describes some of the drinks he's drinking. And that is, um, it's those British tourists, honestly, that give us a little bit of information of what early cocktail culture was like too. Do you have any questions at this point? I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you and you know we're, we're getting to halfway through as well. If you do, throw them in the chat. Because in the middle of the 19th century, the largest influence on the flavor of cocktails was ice. I know that we don't think of ice as being a flavor, but flavor is a combination of, of a lot of things. Um, some of it is taste, like we already talked about bitters and we talked about citrus, right? So we've got acid and bitter there, but it's also temperature. Um, were the bitters a bitter or a sweet flavor? They were bitters. So every bitters, including the ones today, the oldest bitters on the market are Angostura, that they've been continuously produced since the 1930s. A lot of historical bitter companies were shut down uh, at the turn of the 20th century because there were new laws preventing patent medicines since many of them were deadly and addictive. Um, and then also prohibition hit. So there's Peychaud's and there's Angostura from before the 20th century. But any of the modern ones too, they always contain some kind of bittering agent. There are a variety of different herbs and spices that are kind of the traditional additions to it. And then uh, like an aromatic might, will have a lot of what we might call like Christmas style spices and orange bitters will have citrus in it. And now, you know, there are celery bitters, there are lavender bitters, you know, there's all kinds of, there's literally hundreds of different types of bitters out there. So it can be really fun. So it does add a bitter flavor. Again, another dimension to the cocktail. And you get a different experience from bitters, whether you shake them in and mix them into the drink or shake them and leave them on top. So if you've ever had a drink that when you bring it to your nose, it's very aromatic and maybe even see like a little bit of a dark layer on top. Bitters have been shook in and then left to give you that olfactory experience before you take a sip of your drink. So when it comes to the experience of flavor, think about ice cream. Think about what an ice cream is like when it is so firm and cold right out of the freezer versus when it sits in the bowl and melts a little bit. Those are two different flavors, right? So ice becomes a lot cheaper in America in the 1840s. Ice in America was harvested from frozen lakes up here in the Northeast, New York and Connecticut for sure. Um, and up until the 1840s that had been done entirely by hand by men with saws. But in the 1840s, a tool was invented that was horse drawn, but you, can, you can't really see the tool, but you can see the horses um, cutting through the ice. This ice was then stored in ice houses, like you can sort of see uh, in the back here. And then you can also see the train in this image that is shipping insulated ice down to the cities where it will be stored in insulated ice houses. Um, and so much ice was often produced and stored effect 
effectively that cities reported having ice all through the summer and even early into the next fall. So in the middle of the 19th century, that's when we see ice being added to cocktails. Um, Charles Dickens in both his journal of when he was here and then the book that he wrote immediately after mentions the sherry cobbler, which was probably the most, uh, definitely the most popular drink of the middle of the 18th century. It's a much sweeter drink than we were imbibing in at the turn of the 19th century. Um, it is basically sherry and a little bit of sweetener um, poured over really finely crushed or rasped ice, almost like a snow cone. And then the top was sort of a bouquet of fresh in season fruit and fresh mint leaves. Um, and so it was this really cold, refreshing summer drink that because it was both sweeter and lower in alcohol, it was also considered kind of socially acceptable for women to drink it too. So it was the first sort of crossover drink, whereas many of the cocktails were a very gendered men's drink, at least in public. Women would often drink at home and take a shot of bitters in the morning just as well as anyone else. But of course, the biggest difference between um, ice uh, between drinks that have ice and drinks that don't. And again, those earlier like cocktails and slings like that didn't have any, didn't have ice in them or room temperature drinks is that you can't just like sip them like you normally do. You get a face full of ice. So one of the other big influences on the, the flavor of cocktails is the introduction of straws. This happens around the same time as ice starts being used in cocktails because now you can sip the drink up around the ice and continue to enjoy it while, while it melts. And uh, that's also what made the sherry cobbler a really like the most popular drink of the 19th century, because not only did it have ice, but it had this new novelty of a straw. Now straws actually go pretty far back in history. Do I have an ancient straw picture? Ah, well, there's the whole sherry cobbler for you. So um, straws were used actually in ancient Babylonia, Mesopotamia, um, ancient cultures that brewed beer because beer a couple thousand years ago wasn't filtered. And so you'd use a very long straw to drink the beer under like a surface of like bubbling mash and who knows what else. Um, usually those straws were made from a reed, but if you were a fancy person, you might have like a silver and lapis lazuli one. So the concept of straws had been around for a while. They didn't become common and practical until the middle of the 19th century. In America, we largely used rye straw so rye was planted in this country to make rye whiskey out of. The rye itself would be harvested and then the kind of like stubby nubblies left in the field, that is what straw is. It's otherwise used for bedding, but it's hollow. So it could be then harvested a second time and sold to bars to be straws for drinks. So it was basically a waste product that people could profit on. Now, conveying it to your mouth in a different way certainly gives it a different flavor. But people also said that the, the fresh grass straws also had a little bit of sweetness to it that would additionally affect the flavor of drinks. And straw straws are kind of making a comeback right now as people are trying to reduce waste and use less drinking straws. Um, so I've actually been to a couple bars where I've seen them. I've seen them made from oat. I haven't seen any fresh rye ones yet, um, but it was a really exciting thing that I, because I knew they would come back someday. So I about lost my mind on this poor cocktail server when she dropped a drink on my table that used a straw straw. I was very excited. She was very obliging. She brought me the box and everything. And of course we're drinking in bars, but now bars have changed. Um, certainly in the 1860s, there's still a hotel bar, but now bars have become independent institutions as well while maintaining the same uh, name. And cocktails have become so varied and so popular that bartenders themselves have become like a celebrity chef. They've become famous. This image is of one of the most, um, oh, you got a bamboo straw ones for a smoothie. That's cool. Mostly here and I'm in Brooklyn, I've been getting those like uh, straws made from corn. So they're kind of like classic, kind of not. Um, but I know that, there, I know of one bar in particular, the Gatehouses um, here in Brooklyn, that is the bar for Kings County Distillery. They use straw straws, but the owner of that uh, bar and distillery is a really big history person. So it doesn't surprise me that he put straw straws out there. This illustration is of Jerry Thomas. He is the most famous bartender of the 19th century. He wrote that book I've showed you a couple of times, How to Mix Drinks or The Bon Vivant's Companion. It had two titles. And in this illustration, he is mixing his signature drink called the Blue Blazer, which is basically a hot toddy that you set on fire and pour between two pewter mugs. Super fun. 
Um, no one is quite sure where this drink was invented. He's, he was a bartender in San Francisco a little bit. So people think that it was maybe a, sort of a flashy warm up drink for um, people who had stuck it rich and wanted something a little flashier. As you can probably tell from the image, again, these are male spaces. Um, the only public female drinking spaces at this time are German beer halls. The German had a different drinking culture. It was family oriented. So mom, dad would be there and the kids would be running around chewing on a pretzel, uh, but not in American bars. American bars were really only for young men, essentially. One of the biggest changes towards the middle, uh, towards the end of the 19th century is the addition of grenadine. So now we're talking about drinks that look really visibly exciting. And grenadine was being used in Europe in the early 19th century. And in fact, uh, uh, so I should say grenadine is made traditionally from pomegranates, pomegranates and sugar cooked into a syrup. Um, and it's really easy to make it yourself. Double check the recipe, but I'm pretty sure it's just one part uh, pomegranate juice to one part sugar. And you cook it together until the sugar dissolves. And there you go. You've got that bright color and that incredible flavor too. Um, grenadine was really popular in France. There was um, the hours between four and 6 p.m. It was sort of, it's sort of a tradition that when men are walking home from work, women would take the kids and meet him at the bar. And the parents would have a cocktail, maybe some absinthe, and the kids would have lem lemonade or essentially what we would call Shirley Temple, grenadine mixed with seltzer water. This starts getting mixed more into drinks by the end of the 19th century. It at first replaced a lot of drinks that called for raspberry syrup, which is sort of the early like bright red sweetener, probably because the flavor was more complex. But even by the 1880s, um, grenadine not made from pomegranates was being produced in America. And in fact, it was expected. For the most part, even today, grenadine is made with sugar or with today corn syrup, some red flavoring, a little citric acid. It's very, very fake. Um, and it's funny because that was true even in the 19th century. And so here in America, that was the expected flavor and appearance of the cocktail ingredient by the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, not the traditional grenadine syrup. So for example, this is a drink called the Gin Daisy. We've now passed by Jerry Thomas's time from the 1860s. This is from a bar guide from the 1890s. It calls for a mixing glass and you're gonna use one teaspoonful of fine sugar, juice of half lime, one portion Tom Gin, tablespoon raspberry syrup, fill with ice, shake well, strain into tumbler, fill up with siphon, ornament with fruit and serve. This is exactly the kind of recipe uh, that by like the 19 teens and 1920s, bartenders would have been uh, replacing probably the hard to make and only in season raspberry syrup with now shelf stable grenadine or essentially fake grenadine too. Um, so these are Sloppy Joe's cocktails from the 1930s. Yes, 1930s were already in prohibition. A lot of the major American bartenders uh, either went to Europe or went to the Caribbean. And Sloppy Joe's, I believe, was in Cuba. And so these are two of the drinks that are credited to Sloppy Joe's, the Jack Rose, which is a, a great cocktail I really love with a beautiful pink color. It takes lemon, applejack, and grenadine. So if you ever need a, a grenadine cocktail, that's a great one. But also there's the Mary Pickford, named after a famous silent movie star. So it really speaks to the time where these cocktails were first popular, which takes pineapple juice, rum, and grenadine, and a couple drops of maraschino uh, shaken with ice. Both delicious. What is a siphon? So fill up with siphon. I don't know what it would be in this context to be totally honest with you. I mean, I know a siphon is like, it's a tube and you can kind of suck on one end and then you create a, a suction that then allows liquid to flow from one area to another. It's like how you steal gas, honestly. That seems a little ridiculous. I'm gonna look into it, we're gonna find out. Oh, we're back in the Netherlands. Um, however, Virginia, a siphon's a seltzer maker. Thank you. That is the correct thing. Um, there were English colonies within Holland for a while. Uh, the Puritans who came and colonized uh, Plymouth, they uh, all the Puritans were excised to Holland to live there as well. So it's a it's a complicated history. Thank you, Jamie. 
So I've been sure it's cocktails with CO2, which change their texture, making the flavor effervescent and pop. I'm not sure if this definition applies. I think so. I think that what would be, it's strange to you use seltzer uh, or say seltzer because we've seen that in another cocktail recipe. Oh yeah, get the Sloppy Joe's Bar book. Sorry, now I'm jumping around. It comes, uh, there is a really great reprint of it. Um, so I don't know if that means, see how much liquid is in here? Juice half lime. Tom Gin, that's a specific type of British gin, old Tom Gin, tailspin raspberry. No, it's got to be seltzer because I was curious, as you were saying, Jamie, like, were they just injecting it with CO2 to make the whole, like, like, a, you know, one of the countertop, can't think of what those called now. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Jess, it says you can only chat to hosts and panelists, not to everybody. I think that that might be right, Eva. I think that it is, Eva Jane, it is a siphon that was dispensing seltzer water because this cocktail does not have enough liquid in it for it to just be charged with CO2. Thanks, teamwork. I appreciate that. I learned something tonight. We figured it out. Okay, delicious cocktails. Um, let's see, the Gin Daisy, I think is going to be from, I'm gonna just pop these in the chat. Thanks, Jess. Um, Tom Holland's cocktail book. Um, he was a, right, he was a, a, a Black American and this was the first drink book written by a Black man. And then the other one I mentioned is Sloppy Joe's Bartending Guide. And there are repros of all these available. Oh, and then Jerry Thomas, I'll give you the 19th century one too, also available for free online. Jerry Thomas, his book is called How to Mix Drinks or the Bon Vivants Companion. There you go. So as we move into the 20th century, I think that one of the biggest shifts, this is this goes back to what we were just talking about the siphon is, is cola or soda. So at the turn of the 20th century, uh, we are, okay. Seltzer was available in the 19th century, both as like sparkling water. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Eva Jane says, when you watch the old 1930s movies, you'll see the guy make a drink and squirting a seltzer glass with a siphon bottle. I can picture it exactly. Again, being like a longtime New York resident, you still see some of those old seltzer bottles that I really love the glass ones with the psh, psh. I had actually just not known that a siphon was another name for that. So this is like a huge, I'm glad to know this vocabulary. Um, but at that time, if you were drinking sodas, like at the turn of the, 20, uh, turn of the 20th century, um, you know, you were going to like a soda fountain, Coca-Cola came as a condensed syrup, for example, that then the soda jerk would combine with soda water, um, and then you would drink that beverage, and, and these had, uh, were, had purported medicinal qualities as well, but it was Coke, for, for a long time, pushed back on the idea to sell their soda in bottles, they thought that was ridiculous, but they were the first people to do it, and um, basically became hugely successful because they innovated the idea of soda that you could, that was pre-made, could be delivered to your home, bought at a local store, and you could walk away with it. You didn't have to go to the soda fountain to get it. So of course, by the middle of the 20th century, there are lots and lots and lots of soda brands, and people begin to use this as a cocktail mixer. Now, part of what's happened is that in between um, those last books I showed you, um, Tom Holland's book and Sloppy Joe's. Thanks, Jess. She put the link for the Bombing Bunts Companion in there. Um, and the 1950s is that we have gone through prohibition. And so a lot of like passed down bartending knowledge that has been given from bartender to apprentice for the past 120 years was lost. But then also we went through World War II. And in World War II, there wasn't a lot of labor to be producing the farmable goods to make the distillate. And there weren't a lot of men to also do the distilling. We couldn't import a lot of alcohol because a lot of Europe was at war. And so basically one of the few spirits in America had reliable access to was vodka. So with those two big events, you see a big shift in drinking. Again, think Mad Men. In Mad Men, Don Draper orders an old fashioned and that is considered old fashioned at the time to have a mixed cocktail like that. If you're drinking at all, you might be drinking something like the, oh wait, we'll come back to that like the Cuba Libre, which is rum. It says cola drink, but no one makes a Cuba Libre with anything but Coca-Cola and the juice of half a lime. And usually you put up the lime quarter in there too. By the way, I mean, we think this is a rum and Coke today. It's a little bit different to use a white rum. You must use Coca-Cola, put the juice and the peel of a lime in there. And also um, a couple of shakes of aromatic bitters also makes this drink so, so, so delicious. 
This drink might have been developed in the 19th century, um, the late 19th century, which with the Cuban Revolution and the sort of um, colonization of Cuban by America, and then our, our F Teddy Roosevelt, it's, it's a whole thing. Thank you, Jess, again. Sloppy Joe's Bar Guide is in the chat. Anyway, Americans were in Cuba at the end of the 19th century. And so in Cuba, they had access to lime, they had access to really excellent rum, and then Coca-Cola had been sold in Cuba since like the mid 19th century. So it's thought that this drink was actually made during the Spanish-American War. Um, un unknown, unknown, but it becomes really popular by the mid 1950s. Um, and so, you know, all of those like, yes, there's punches, but it's vodka, Sprite, and Sherbert, like all of these sort of really simple soda-based, soda-based plus one alcohol, like two or three ingredient mixed drinks. These come about in the 1950s and basically last us through the end of the 20th century. So this is probably what a lot of us, I won't say grew up with, but certainly when I started drinking in my 20s, like it was rum and Cokes or Jack and Cokes or nothing. That was pretty much what we were drinking until, oh, so where people were drinking to also shifted in the middle of the 20th century, as did all life, as opposed to public social spaces, uh, really communities in the city or like a central bar or tavern in a rural area, drinking moved into the home. People moved to the suburbs, um, family focused and neighborhood focused. And so this is when we really start to see wet bars pumped up, popped up. Um, a wet bar is a bar that is plumbed in that you have access to water. So it's basically, you're taking what used to be a public space where a professional bartender um, makes a drink for you. And now you're doing all that in your home. So it might also be why cocktails got a lot simpler because it's just any old person mixing them at home as opposed to a professional like Jerry Thomas pouring goblets of fire back and forth too. So again, this is also a space where traditionally women are doing their drinking too, and now that becomes more socially acceptable because men are also drinking at home as well. The biggest change in the last quarter of the 20th century is the infusion of flavored vodkas, of which we're still seeing a huge propagation of. Um, the market and the rate of new flavored vodkas has finally begun decreasing within the past five years. It's a way for smaller brands to grab some shelf space or for larger brands to just like put something new out there, sort of diversify their product. Um, the earliest ones came out in the mid 1980s and they were flavors of Absolute. It was Absolute Limon, uh, which is a citrus Absolute vodka, and Absolute Papar, which was jalapeno flavored vodka. And very soon, uh, it was actually as much as I think that we sort of look at these flavored vodkas askance today, it was the introduction of these flavored vodkas that brought a culture of mixology back rather than a rum and coke or whiskey over on the rocks, which is delicious, don't get me wrong. But again, cocktail culture started coming back in the 1980s and early 90s with these flavored vodkas because a couple of the most iconic drinks of the 90s and 2000s were famously made with these vodkas. We might, for example, remember the Cosmopolitan. Sex and the City did a lot for mixology because they drank Cosmos at the bar. Now, something like a Cosmopolitan had been introduced by uh, Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice in the mid 1950s. And there's even like another similar drink in the 1960s. I'll show you a recipe. The Sands Cosmopolitan is from 1989, and it's a little bit closer to like the those 50s, 1950s and 60s drinks. Sorry, I'm in Brooklyn. There is a ambulance going by. Okay, there it went. So this uses light and dark rum, cranberry juice. You can see the ocean spray connection. Um, as in as opposed to the absolute limon, which will later be the iconic ingredient in this drink, this uses a splash of Contro and the splash of roses lime juice. So um, this is the first drink known to be called, called the Cosmopolitan. Um, that is, uh, yeah, so this was in San Juan. There's another claim to fame that's a little bit earlier from Miami. It's a little bit hard to know, but it is then slightly after this that the drink evolves to the pink uh, vodka, lemon vodka drink that, you, that we all saw on Sex in the City. And because the drink had such a distinctive color, people would ask for it because they wanted that same class. They wanted that big, wide, wobbly martini glass, showing off that pink drink, showing off that they knew the reference, um, and they are drinking a sophisticated mixed drink. 
that also, especially the wobbly white glass, spawned a hyphen martini, hyphen teeny craze, the biggest of which was the apple teeny, which was a huge hit in the early 20th century. It seems to evolved out of LA and that is made with like a sour apple flavored vodka and has a really distinctive green flavor, usually from like apple pucker or something like that. So again, the pink drink, the green drink, people would see it, they'd see the fancy glass, I wanted to try it. And even though honestly, the idea of these drinks makes my stomach turn right now. I think the Cosmo was the first drink I ordered in a fancy bar though, because I was there in the early 2000s, I was there with someone who ordered it and I didn't know how to order cocktails because I was 21. Um, it, this is what got us back to mixology. This was like the start of the movement that returned uh, bartenders behind the bar, that got people looking at pre-prohibition references. And, um, you know, but up until that point, I guess you were probably drinking these at like a foam party in college. That's my guess. You can tell me otherwise. So today we've got these, not just throw about cocktails, but often these beautifully either refurbished or made to look old spaces where you can drink a huge variety of cocktails. Some of them absolutely straight out of the 19th century, straight out of the pages of Jerry Thomas's bartending guide. Interestingly, I follow a few cocktail writers on Twitter, and one of them said recently that the mixology movement has, has improved cocktail culture as a whole, and that he's had a lot of good cocktails. But, for, but as there are more and more good cocktails, he's encountered fewer and fewer great cocktails. And actually, I actually agree with that. I don't know, maybe it was the newness of it that I thought, it was so new to me that I thought this was great because it was so different than a Jack and Coke, right? But maybe sometimes things are getting too complicated, I think, in bars. Um, we just, you know, we have come and gone into a very interesting time, the mixology moment, the throwing it back to the 19th century moment. And now, honestly, I'm really curious to see what comes next because it feels like this movement has peaked. So what is on our horizon? I'm a historian, I can't predict the future and I don't really know, but I would love to know maybe one of the most unusual or unusually flavored or delicious cocktails you've had recently. You could type a little something in the chat. Maybe this will be like a little bit of palm reading to see what trends are gonna have next. There's a lot of cucumber cocktails right out there right now in the summertime. That's what I've noticed over my, I've been in the city here for a month and uh, I have no complaints. I really enjoy a cucumber cocktail. It's very refreshing. Sort of Pim's Cup-esque, um, but again, their takes on sort of an older cocktail. And then additionally, it's to tell you about what you've been drinking, um, I would also love to answer any questions you may have. Just, I'm going to look up very briefly that 1890s cocktail guide that I mentioned, because maybe I'm getting his name wrong. Hang on. Oh, sorry, I must have missed that one. No, it's okay, but I, I just feel like maybe I didn't get it right. Anyone has any questions, you can send them to the chat. I'm sorry to say I haven't had a, um, a really sophisticated cocktail in quite a while, so. <laughs> Tom Bullock is his name. Tom uh, Bullock. The ideal, the ideal Bartender is the book. Ideal bartender, and I see your question, Karen. That's a great one. The ideal bartender, uh, and his name is Tom Bullock. Great book. Um, my favorite cocktail bar in Boston um, was Eastern Standard, and that closed down recently. And my second favorite cocktail bar in Boston is Drink. And if Fred is behind the bar, tell him I say hi. <laughs> Do I have a favorite cocktail? I you know, I am kind of a whiskey drinker. Interestingly, I, I did get into whiskey even before I started drinking beer. Um, so like, I would say my go-to is a, is like an old fashioned or a Manhattan. Um, I love a mint julep in the summer as well. Um, but sometimes, you know, when I go to a new cocktail bar, I'm not sure what to order. I often ask the bartender what they're really excited about mm -hmm. and what they think is really special, interesting on the menu. And that, and as long as I commit to agreeing with that, like whatever in my head, I'm like, whatever they say you're gonna order. Cause oftentimes it's flavors that I don't think I will like or like together. And then usually it's one of the best cocktails I've ever had. Um, one of my favorite cocktails that I've had here in New York city is at a bar called Mace, which is uh, in the East village. And it was like an, an ube cocktail. And it was 
so good. It was, I mean, I like ube a lot now, but like, it's just not something, I don't know. It was so delicious. I don't remember what was, else was in, in it, but it was creamy and a little bit tart. It was wonderful. Ooh, I love this. So JB says, I haven't had a proper cocktail in ages, but a friend of mine made a rhubarb based cocktail. She named a Ruby Wednesday. <laughs> Perfect. I nice. love it. So this is my favorite. I love the classics, but oh, what is ube? So that's actually uh, U-B-E with a little um, mark over the E. And ube is, uh, it's a purple taro root and it's a really popular flavor in um, Southeast Asian desserts. Now that I've said it, she'll probably see it around out there. Like uh, it's in uh, New York, it's become really popular in like ice cream. There's a cookie recipe. It's, it's like really big, like matcha you might be familiar with. Ube is kind of its purple friend. And it just is like creamy and sweet and just, I don't know, it, um, maybe a little floral, maybe a little sweet potato like, a little like sweet potato so you can see how it would work in a dessert as well as, as it has this really compelling color too. I love it. I fall, And I recently had pandan for the first time, not in a cocktail. Um, okay, so the, the first one I mentioned in Boston has closed down, unfortunately, that was Eastern Standard. But the other one that is open and amazing is drink. So many cocktails had to taste the alcohol. I know alcohol-free versions the ones I like. Mike, that's also such a good point because we didn't even, you know what? That is, that would be the ninth one if I put it in here. There's been such a huge trend in terms of non-alcoholic spirits. It's really fascinating. Basically every bar, cocktail bar I've been to here, I've seen a few behind the bar. There's over 120 different brands out there producing non-alcoholic mixers and spirits. Um, and it's a really fascinating, yeah, transition. And I think that's great because there's a huge variety of reasons that any individual might not be drinking at any night. And I love that. I feel like it used to be that you were sort of, you got your eyes rolled out if you just ordered like a seltzer, a bitters and seltzer, you know, or something like that. Oh, you know, she's not going to spend money tonight. I love that cocktail bars have now embraced people not drinking because that means it's much more inclusive. They can bring many more people into the bars. I can still go hang out with my friends, even if I'm on antibiotics or whatever. Um, oh, I see there's also a bar suggestion. The Baldwin Bar in Woburn is a pretty good bar. I'd love it um, if any of you New Englanders would also put some, oh, thank you, Jamie, the Ube um, cookie recipes out there. Yeah, Virginia, I do too. I think that tea, black or green tea, um, you know what? I even forgot to mention that. I said that you put water in punch. If you can, all the recipes would recommend the five ingredients, one uh, to use um, tea instead of water, because it adds not quite a savory base, but just like a richer base to your beverages too. So yeah, when I'm adapting a uh, cocktail for it to be non-alcoholic, I do the same thing, Virginia. That's such a smart move is you brew a strong tea of whatever you like. And you know, if it's like an infused tea, a cardamom tea, you can do something else with it. So Jackson Cannon, formerly of Eastern Standard host, Boston.com Cocktail Club online on Thursdays featuring a local bartender. I do know Frederick Yarm, Renee. That's why I said say hi to Fred behind the bar. I can't even remember. Oh, here's why. Okay, so ages ago now, sort of early in my career as a culinary historian, I used to run bar crawls. I would do one uh, in New York City somewhere, and I would do one in Boston. And it was very specifically, I called it the 19th century pub crawl. And we would go to bars that either had existed since the 19th century or were making 19th century inspired cocktails. And it was not your normal pub crawl. We were a much more refined crew. People would dress up in incredible costumes and sort of like reenact this little experience. And so when Frederick Garn first started uh, blogging as cocktail virgin, like he came on one of the tours and we met. And uh, now he's a bartender at Drink. And I've seen him a couple of times too when I've worked at Tales of the Cocktail too. Great guy, has written some great cocktail books. Um, oh, that's so funny. Well, tell him I say hi. Um, it was a really fun thing to do. Oh, I wish I, I didn't put my further reading page for some reason. All right, that's my book, obviously. The other, so Frederick Yarm has a couple great books out there. And for you Bostonians, he has one called Drink Boston. Um, that is a really great one. Also, if you're interested to learn more about cocktail history, you should read uh, David Wondrich. Um, he has a great article about the origin of the name cocktail, which has only been recently, he only recently discovered. 
Um, but also he has two great books out there. One is called Imbibe, which is a history of the cocktail, focuses a lot on American history and gives a lot of recipes. And the second one is Punch, and that is more like a world history of punch. They're both wonderful books just to sit down and read, as well as great recipe books and great reference books too. So I highly recommend his writing as well. And there's so much else we could talk about. We didn't even get into Tiki. There's so much. I find it such a fascinating <laughs> cultural history. My we pleasure, everyone. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Oh my God, it's January 6th tonight. Oh, well, glad I'm oh, getting you fun. out there for the primetime TV. Um, <laughs> and you know what? I have a, a cocktail recipe I have to recipe test. So that's what I'm doing when I log off too. Perfect timing for me. All right, Sarah, thank you so much for another awesome presentation. I tried to keep up with all of the things that you were referencing and I'll try to share those links when I send out the recording. And yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Absolutely, my pleasure, everybody. And I hope to see you back here in August for our next presentation. Thanks as always for having me, Jess. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Bye.